Good morning. Uh, look, this is a bit more like it, isn't it? Um, summer's arrived. Still got my soft shell on because it's still a little fresh, but but we've had a you know a few days of quite nice weather. Good, isn't it? It's only July. Anyway, um, yeah. So, dog walk diary episode four of the coach education is broken series this one is called fixing the leaky bucket so one of the problems so in this whole series i'm in the process of i guess describing a series of i call them system shifts but um so on the one hand we've got to obviously make a shift in the way the system, the education system that we're part of, and also we design and create, um, you know, whether that's locally or nationally or regionally or whatever. Um, and from a policy standpoint as well about how we allocate resources towards this. Um, so we're calling, we call for a system shift, but also that requires a mindset shift. It requires a change of thinking. So the system shifts are as much about changing the way we think about coach ed, coach development, and at the same time, thinking, then using that change of thinking for us to then begin to design systems and structures and things like that uh, accordingly. Um, and some of that might be to not have things in such a systemic way, but we'll talk about that in future episodes uh, or a systematic way, let's say. Um, so, um, when we're talking about um, this notion of fixing the leaky bucket. So, one of the problems in coach education is, and this is really shown across the board, well, first and foremost, um, generally speaking, the data that people hold, that is held on coaches and, and their activities is really quite poor um, as a general rule. And it's a generalisation, and I'm always generalising in these videos, because it's obviously pockets of good practice everywhere. But in general, across the industry, uh, data itself is quite poor. And, the result of, and one of the results of having that data is, is that we, for example, don't know how many coaches are needed for any given situation or role. Or, you know, so for example, like the like sort of labour market data, labour market analysis doesn't really uh, provide, uh, you know, organisations that are putting resources into, you know, kind of the education and development and training of coaches. You know, you don't know whether supply is meeting demand. So, for example, you know, people will say, oh, we need 3,000 new coaches. Why? Uh, ah, because, you know, we want to grow participation and we want to do these sorts of things. But the problem you've got is, is that you don't know how many coaches are active right now and how many hours they're doing. So very rarely do people make the connection and think, actually, what are our existing coaches currently doing? How many hours are they doing? How many hours could they be doing? Like, are they maxed or do they want to be doing more? Could they be doing more if given the opportunity to? Likewise, um, very, very often we're using very, very broad and general um, descriptions of coaches so we need x number of coaches at level one or activator or whatever it might be but actually we need to be more sophisticated than that as i've talked about in previous episodes you know we need to be talking about specific roles for specific audiences so you need to be able to answer the question of how many coaches do i have that are appropriately developed and trained and resourced and professionally recognized that are able to work with um, people, for example, like young young people, um, let's say with you know moderate learning difficulties, Asperger's autism, um, in you know a range of different um, domains, maybe talent development or club or uh, a recreational space or in an area of deprivation or something along those lines. We don't have that sophistication, and we don't have an understanding of the kind of training and experiences that coaches have. Because again, you know, a coach who's got experience of working with those audiences is as good in some ways uh, as a coach 
who's been trained because be, being trained is no guarantee of uh, of uh, uh, of delivery and quality just because you've been on a course doesn't mean you're any good uh, as we've talked about before so people's experiences could be factored into that so could we gather data around the experiences of our coaches and what they're capable of doing so that we understand a little bit more about what our workforce looks like and what it is capable of doing pretty challenging pretty difficult um but not not beyond our capabilities um so um why is that important why am i talking about data um well if you've got a better understanding of what your workforce looks like and what it's capable of you can then be much more sophisticated and targeted about the um the ways in which you recruit or the ways in which you retrain if you like your existing workforce to meet the changing demands of you know a range of different contexts and the problem without having that information is what we've generally done is gone we just need more and what are the drivers of that well one is there's a demand you know so each year x number of people will present to whoever the training provider is saying i want to do a course and we take that demand and go okay we'll take you on brilliant and we train these people and off they go and they do whatever they do now generally speaking the fact there is a demand means somebody wants to coach and generally speaking you assume that they've got somebody to coach uh, not always you have what you call badge collectors who uh, you know just want the course so that they can use it for a future career and make sure that they're you know they seem really employable um, <clears throat> but generally speaking you know somebody who wants to do a course wants to do so for a reason but <clears throat> not always and um likewise um uh and but also the fact that somebody wants to do a course doesn't necessarily mean that that's kind of the the sort of individual that we need to uh, uh develop for a specific purpose you know we don't know that that's necessarily the case so what we might end up doing is just having the same kind of person you know i say the same kind of person the same person from the same background you know with the same sorts of outlooks this that and the other coming to us because you know they're working within the environments that we tend to work in and then we just get a perpetuation of the same level of skills it doesn't really help us with opening up the doors to coaching and bringing a broader range of people into the world of coaching to help us uh, engage so and so what we end up in a situation of doing is we end up with people coming and coming to us and we say yes and we have a demand so off we go we just keep churning it and churning it out but what we're not looking at is what are the retention rates and what we're seeing when when you start to see organizations that have got improved data and improved analytics on their coaching workforce is that we see a massive drop off so people come they get trained they coach for a period of time a couple of years maybe something along those lines then they stop so we need more constantly need more constantly need more constantly need more and when you ask the question about why people are stopping it usually comes down to a range of reasons some of the obvious ones like my parent my, i got involved because of my children my children are no longer involved so i've stopped doing it <coughs> that's obvious but <coughs> equally you get <coughs> a lot of people saying um they're disillusioned with it that it's um you know it's not it's they're not uh it doesn't excite them anymore or they're finding it hard or they're finding it challenging or they're not supported or they've not been given the resources to be able to help them out and so all of those things make a massive difference morning um and all those things make a massive impact um on uh our ability or their ability to uh identify how many coaches we're going to need for any specific role or specific specific purpose so what we end up doing <coughs> is um we worry we we keep recruiting thinking that that's going to solve the problem but what we're not doing is we're not recruiting the people with the skills for the roles like the experienced people we're exp- we're recruiting rookies we're bringing new people in all the time and that's fine but basically then you've just got rookies coaching rookies constantly so the shift in thinking needs to move away from the idea of um you know just continuously topping up our bucket to fixing the leaks so we need to shift away from thinking i just get new coaches because any coach is as good as any coach as long as i've got a a warm body 
to deliver a session, that's good. I've ticked my box and I can run my activities. If we're going towards a more quality assured pro approach and a more professionally recognised approach, then what we need to do is be much more sophisticated. What we need to do is move towards thinking about how do we keep our best people? How do we ensure that our most skilled and experienced people are deployed with those with the greatest needs? Um, how do we make sure that we don't allow a skills drain to happen just because we are totally focused on recruitment and bringing new people in? It's what happens a lot of the time um, in um, different sort of retail sectors. I don't know if any of you try to think about like when you think mobile phones, all the deals are for the, attracting the new customer who's kind of coming across from a different um, supplier. Yeah, if you're an existing customer, there's no deals for you. So you feel like really marginalised and like, you know, like they're just being taken advantage of. And it's, me it's very similar for a lot of coaches. They feel like they're just being, you know, kind of used for their, um, you know, or, or they're not being given the support they need. They're not being given the resources they need. They're not being given um, the kind of, uh, they don't, they're not given the kind of experiences that they might want to get. So the call really is to shift our thinking towards when we've got people who've been within our, within our, our world for a while and they're experienced and they've um, developed and they're committed and they're you know, really providing great experiences, we've got to do our level best to think about not letting them just decide to leave because you know, they just get disillusioned because there's no support. We've got to place much, much more emphasis on retaining our skilled workforce. Now think about this like in any other industry. Like if you were running a major company and you had a, you know, someone like, uh, you had a, a sales force, you know, that was out there delivering, you know, your, your product to the community. And in our case, our product is a service in the form of physical activity experiences. If you had a workforce doing those kinds of things, and by the way, I'm not reducing human beings to service deliverers, but just imagine, for a second um, that we did that and you just every time you put effort and energy and training and support into a into individual into individuals to get them to a point where they're really good um, you you then sort of take your eye off the ball and just bring in new continuously um, and then those and you basically just lose great skilled individuals and have to try and replace them with brand new rookies that's not a good business model um, by the way, it happens everywhere. This is not unique to sport. There's a lot of sport, a lot of, um, I think it was Henry Ford who famously said, he was asked a question by somebody on his board, I think, or someone like that, who said, what if we train our people and they leave? And Henry Ford said, you're looking at it the wrong way. What if we don't train our people and they stay? And so <laughs> he's kind of pointing to this fact that we as a, or, you know, as a, a kind of a in, a, in this people development world, we need to be much more human in the way we approach this. <clears throat> Think about the people in our workforce and their needs and work out the best ways we have to support them. And I promise you, it can be in the smallest thing. It can be <clears throat> getting an e a personalised email from a head coach saying, you're doing a great job and we value you. You know, somebody that's, you know, important and all that sort of stuff. It can be that. It could be a video from someone like that. It could be, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, a conference that's organised and because you're an experienced coach and you're committed and, you know, you're, it's shown that you're part of your CPD, this, that and the other, you get, you get that at a significant discount. You know, it could be getting, you know, kind of um, uh, unique content that... Uh, only you as an experienced individual benefits from you know so at the moment um people who are kind of considered to be kind of like committed dedicated advanced coaches the only way they their de their um <coughs> communicate is because they've been on a course an advanced coach course or something like that and then they become part of this community but what about all the other advanced coaches who are out there who are probably just as skilled just haven't done the course because it didn't exist at the time when they did theirs doesn't mean they're not any they're not skilled but they're not recognized and that's uh you know and so those people just begin to start to fritter away and that's happening to me i'll be honest with you um you know i'm finding it increasingly difficult eh, partly because of different roles i've got and all that sort of stuff but but you know never you never receive you know 
any kind of thing you know that, that basically recognizes your um your uh the contribution you're making to the world and the all that sort of stuff so anyway um that's the system shift let's stop constantly filling up this bucket that's basically just got got water pouring out the bottom let's fix the leaks with better support and help people to understand a little bit more about um it, you know th their value and how much we value them and in so doing and this can be by the way and this can be done locally as well and in so doing let's retain quality um <clears throat> and grow thought and physical activity together because we've got people who are really well supported supporting other people by providing really great experiences um, and helping them develop there you go episode four done uh, now, as always, if you're um, interested in any of this, then uh, reach out. Um, please share, share this. Um, you know, um, if you can ba basically uh, uh, share this to people on, you know, so that they can watch the video or uh, listen to the podcast. Definitely listen to the podcast is, is really good, the audio version. Um, and likewise, you know, begin a conversation. Reach out to me if I can help or uh, provide some support or guidance then i'm more than happy to uh, a couple of people already have and that's great um and then the other thing to um uh, just to say as well is that um you know if you're um if you can subscribe that's great um that's brilliant because that helps it grow um so either this channel youtube one or on the audio helps with the growth morning, morning. um so anyway there you go uh see you for episode five